This video is sponsored by Magellan TV. Check it out via the link in the description. Also, this video is a companion to our two-part series on the history of the Bolsheviks. You can check it out by clicking the link on the top right of your screen. While this video totally works on its own, knowing the history of the Bolsheviks will add useful context. Creating our last three videos on the Bolsheviks and Marxism-Leninism has left us with a few miscellaneous thoughts, tangents, and other cut content that couldn't make it into the main videos. But that cut content is absolutely worth its own video, and that's what you're watching right now. So you can call me Ezekiel. And this is a Leftist Potluck. It's a core Marxist belief that only industrialized countries are capable of becoming communist. Supposedly, only the industrialized countries have proletariats large and concentrated enough to overthrow capitalism. But historically, that just isn't what happened. That's why the Marxist world was so shocked when the German Revolution failed while the Russian Revolution succeeded. So Marxism was clearly wrong. It's the Marxist-Leninists who got it right. But that created its own problems. First, it meant that the industry-obsessed communists were only coming to power in countries that were not industrialized. This helps explain why the Marxist-Leninist regimes were so obsessed with rapid industrialization. They always felt inadequate compared to the hypothetical Marxist societies that inspired them. The second issue is that the revolution wasn't global. The workers of the world just didn't unite. While I don't think it was explicitly stated, there's at least an implication in Marxist thought that if the revolution was not global, then the capitalist world would come together and destroy it. And you know what? That's exactly what happened. The rest of the world did come together, and they did destroy communism. The third and final issue is that Marxism-Leninism didn't just prove that Marx got it wrong, but that he had things totally upside down. Not only is communism's success not correlated with a society's level of industrialization, it has an inverse correlation. After the revolution in Russia, it must have seemed to the early Marxist-Leninists that their discovery was that it's possible for both industrialized and partially industrialized countries to have communist revolutions. Or in other words, that partially industrialized societies are the least industrialized a society can be and still become communist. But what they had really discovered is that a partially industrialized society is the most industrialized a society can be and still become communist. Historically, it's not the most industrialized societies that turn to communism. It's the least industrialized. Up next, we're going to talk about the Fabians. But first, we need to talk about this video's sponsor, a rising star in the video streaming world, Magellan TV. Magellan TV features high-quality documentaries covering a wide array of real-world topics. Since we've been talking so much about leftism on this channel, I recommend their series Evolution of Evil, which has episodes dedicated to the infamous communist leaders Stalin, Mao, and North Korea's Kim Dynasty. The Stalin episode is especially interesting, because it gets into Stalin's early bandit years, and how the tragic death of his first wife helped harden him into the infamous Man of Steel. Magellan TV's catalog isn't just limited to history, but also includes science, true crime, nature, and so much more. At least 20 hours of new content are added to the platform every week, and every subscription includes the ability to play them at 4K resolution. And the best part? There are no ads on Magellan TV. Ever. So claim our special offer for Magellan TV by clicking the link in the description and pinned comment below this video, which includes a one-month free trial and be sure to check out their series, Evolution of Evil. And now, back to the video. It goes without saying that the Bolsheviks were revolutionaries, but what happened to the reformist attempts at communism? Well, there were the Mensheviks, who the Bolsheviks rounded up and killed, so it's no use learning from them. Luckily, there's another group of communist reformers who the Bolsheviks couldn't get their hands on. The British Fabians. Let's compare them. In one corner, we have the OG revolutionaries, the Marxist-Leninists, the Bolsheviks. They're bringing a powerful argument to the ring with an ideology that's overthrown dozens of capitalist countries all around the world. 
And in the other corner, we have the reformists, the wolves in sheep's clothing, the Fabians. Expect a close fight, because their record is just as strong. Having themselves overthrown... Uh, well, let's see here. Okay, well, the Fabians at least accomplished... Uh, actually, the Fabians haven't accomplished anything. Frankly, they're losers. The Fabians have been around for over a hundred years, and they still haven't overthrown British capitalism. Not even once! In that same time, the Marxist-Leninists were able to come into existence, take over half the world, and destroy themselves. Yet, in spite of that, every couple of months, right-wingers will scaremonger about the Fabians. They do the same thing with the Marxists, who, remember, were wrong and failed to accomplish anything. It was only the Marxist-Leninists who had any success. This fear-mongering is more condemnation of right-wing stupidity than Fabian or Marxist strength. And dialectics can tell us why. In terms of strategy, you cannot control your enemies, but you can influence them. That's what dialectics are for. When you take up a position, you create a dialectical pressure on your enemy to oppose it. They won't always take the bait, but when they do, it can create a significant advantage. The Narodniks are a great example of failing to consider dialectics. Sure, terrorism, or as they called it, the propaganda of the deed, will inspire your allies, but it'll inspire your enemies a hell of a lot more. No act of Narodnik terror ever accomplished anything other than convincing the Russian regime to crush them. Narodnik terrorism wasn't just a dialectical failing, but a strategic mistake as well. As a matter of strategy, you're not supposed to attack the enemy where they're strong. You're supposed to attack them where they're weak. And yet, anarchists were once obsessed with the use of revolutionary violence to destroy the state. Dynamite was a particular passion of theirs, but that idea was just plain stupid. The state is, by definition, the institution best capable of using violence. Never mind the morality of terrorism, using small-scale violence to oppose the state is a strategic error. The anarchists found their enemy's greatest strength, violence, and then tried to challenge them with it. It's no wonder why the anarchists failed. What all of this means is that whenever the right picks Marxism or Fabianism or even anarchism as its boogeyman, it's engaging in self-sabotage. They're orienting themselves to fight foes that aren't dangerous. And just like how light weights don't build muscle, weak enemies are not a shortcut to success. They're only a path to atrophy. The Bolsheviks had no choice but to be revolutionaries. Their ideology was so different from that which dominated Russia that only a revolution could implement their vision. But in terms of strategy, what are reformers supposed to do? Ideologies that like the existing order, but that want to implement a variation of it must be reformist, and will always be counter-revolutionary. After all, their revolution already happened. Another revolution will destroy the fundamental order they need to have their specific vision implemented. The transitions from classical liberalism to modern liberalism to neoliberalism may sometimes be called revolutions, but that's an exaggeration. They were reforms. The fundamental underlying order always remained a liberal one. Contemporary liberals and conservatives may claim to hate each other, but they're both fundamentally liberals. So if there's ever a real threat to their order, they'll set aside their differences and work to defend it. You see it today with how both left-wing and right-wing politicians pay lip service to the idea that, whatever their differences, they should always work together to oppose and counteract radicalism. That is the counter-revolution. The most subversive thing a reformer might do during a revolution is to cry compromise. To say, listen, powers that be, neither of us want those radicals in charge. But you have to admit that they have a point. Some change is needed, so let us do it. And before we go, I want to add a bonus thought for an ideology on the exact opposite corner of the political compass. And Caps, we need to talk about the McNukes. Anchor's marching home again, hurrah, hurrah. We'll give it a hearty welcome then, hurrah, hurrah. Because, for a bunch of alleged capitalists, you guys suck at branding. I mean, just look at the McDonald's menu. They're not McChicken Nuggets, they're Chicken McNuggets. So your nukes shouldn't be McNuclear Missiles, they should be Nuclear Mick Missiles. God, it's like I have to do all the work for you. Anyway, in the unlikely event of an ANCAP takeover, I hope this contribution will spare me from the Liberty Gulags. 
And that's the leftist potluck. This video was funded by an alliance of leftists from across the political spectrum, moments before falling apart due to infighting, including Josiah, and by this video's sponsor, Magellan TV. Claim our special offer for Magellan TV by clicking the link in the description and pinned comment below this video, which includes a one-month free trial. And be sure to check out their series, Evolution of Evil. The description is also where you'll find links to where you can support us directly. Like, comment, and subscribe for more. I'll see you in the next one.